coming to you live, but not really. It is all pump and no circumstance with Ryder Richards on LetUsThinkAboutIt.com, the amateur hour you should never tune into. Welcome back. This week, we're going to get into cybernetics, which sounds very much like cyborgs and cyberpunk. Uh, It can make you think of things like robots and computing and AI. And a lot of that can probably come from fiction, things like William Gibson's Neuromancer or Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. We could also even think of things like The Terminator, and we're going to be talking about that next episode. But cybernetics is really much broader than all that. It's kind of a way of thinking, and it can apply to social and cognitive science as well as the human body and language. And of course, since it's a way of thinking, it features prominently in philosophy. Today, we're going to look at cybernetics from the early days, how it operates from machine use all the way into the economy, and then how philosophers Deleuze and Watati discuss territorialization and then deterritorialization. And of course, in part three, we're going to wrap all this up by discussing Mark Fisher's idea of re-territorialization, and I'm going to sort of talk through, I don't know, a possible solution for this, uh, for the mix of cybernetics within capitalism. And of course, this is all a step in our journey to better understand the nature of contradictions and double binds within society, capitalism, and of course, ourselves. While the conversation today may sound a bit limiting or stifling even, maybe oppressive, I will of course bring up a couple options at the end, and then our entire next episode is going to be on a very compelling and strange response called accelerationism. But of course, we have to cover this to cover that, and so on with the show. Part 1. Cybernetics The systems theory of cybernetics has a wiki fun fact of the day, kids. Cybernetics was originally dubbed the art of self-governance by none other than Plato way back in the Republic. Hooray! So it's really old. Yeah. So anyway, while they applied cybernetics to really self regulation and governmental regulation in ancient times, most examples that we kind of stumble across today are in terms of machine devices that self-regulate. The first of these was a water clock, and now we have engines with governors within them that can somehow balance extreme forces for a very steady rate of operation. So in short, cybernetic machines stabilize themselves without the need for lots of external fiddling and inputs. Now. An example that is given is a thermostat in your house, and what it does is regulate temperature. It senses the current temperature and reacts to maintain a steady environment that's comfortable for you. Now, another type is a steam engine, and a steam engine has a release valve when the pressure gets too high or else the tank explodes. Now, cybernetics as a thing was developed way back in the 1940s by, of course, many people because it's not a new idea, but most notably Norbert Weiner? Weiner? I don't know how you say it. Let's say Wiener. (laughs) Uh, So the timeline here is important though because post-World War I into World War II, you had the prominence of the Frankfurt School of Philosophers and Freud with the influence of Marx and Hegel. But they were all sort of in the midst of chaos. There was industrialization and ballooning capitalism which caused havoc, such as the Great Depression. And on the global and governmental side, we of course have the devastation of World War I And of course, the increasing racism and nationalism that's going on and the outbreak of fascism, which I heard at the time was kind of a new political style. So yeah, amplifying chaos and pressure, well, these people needed regulation. So it is only natural they would look to these machines as a model. And of course, as we know, every major technology becomes how we describe humans. So at the time, things became described as machine forces, machinic. While today we have moved past the idea of, I don't know, humans as machines or humans as computers into humans as, I don't know what, right? What are we now? Unfathomable quantum potential, or maybe we're just dark matter, right? Or maybe humans have actually just been reduced now to the most common metric, which is the social media-like. But anyway, I digress. The human itself is self-regulating, and it does things like moderate temperature to stay within homeostasis, but also psychologically in terms of repression and release. Now, in a machinic way, the input-output can be moderated, and this can be seen as cause and effect. It happens with people too, right? Now, this is, of course, highly reductionist, 
but it can help as a model when you consider how a machine must balance itself. And it gets even more complicated, of course, when you look at something like a supply-demand economy and the implications of it. Now, the term cybernetics actually comes from circular causality, and they talk about steering a ship and the need to continue reacting to the environment, which reminds us, of course, of our last episode, which is step 65, and we talked about the circular path of opposing antagonisms. And these are described as points moving around on a circle reacting to each other to maintain a deadlock dance. Now, this is dynamic, but it also provides a balanced steady state despite all its extremism. Now, the more complex a system, that is, of course, the more variables that are at play, fluctuations can actually be masked as other elements react to them. So what happens is the more complex it gets, we don't see the problem site-wide or system-wide until a tipping point is hit. And from there, it's a cascade of failures that just can't be stopped, right? Which is essentially exponential breakage. Now, the whole point of a complex system is to actually buffer and regulate small changes so we don't hit catastrophe. That's how our environment works. Part 2. One Dimension of Capital Going back and looking at Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man concept, this is a book written in the 1960s and we lightly covered it in Step 63. But it's all about the pervasiveness of consumerism shaping our lives until we lose the spirit to rebel. We can, in cybernetic terms, see that industrial capitalism produces a surplus. This is kind of like extra steam threatening to explode the system. So it must somehow be put to use or diverted. The system must manage its excess. Marcuse says capitalism reshapes our desire so we crave these surpluses, these false needs, as he calls them. We chase and accumulate them for social standing. That is, social production we produce and consume for society. So don't get them wrong. We may actually have individual natural desires for these items, but capitalism operates beyond sufficiency, beyond survival. But ironically, of course, this capitalism-enhanced excessive desire leads to monetizing basic survival. And the contradiction is, that the desire for excess and accumulation provokes poverty and burning through resources, all in the midst of overabundance. This is the society we produce and maintain through consumption. Now, Marcuse says capitalism short circuits our natural desires or natural repressions into surplus desires or surplus repressions. And that might be questionable, but the idea either way is that there's surplus. And in this excessive desiring state, capitalism is the one dimensionality that Marcuse speaks of. Mar capitalism is really this all-encompassing, reshaping, short-circuiting way of living where no alternative can transcend the logic of capitalism. And this is really the ultimate justification that we're all subjected to. Now, that's all kind of abstract, so let's give it some relatability. Adam Kotzko, he says that people now argue that workplace diversity enhances productivity, which sounds like something you'd hear in the workplace, and it very well may do that. But the real plea of diversity is actually for justice. We should want justice, even if it comes at the cost of economic productivity. But in the capitalist system, under one-dimensional cybernetic management, all goals become reinscribed, they're made subject to, and translated into the rules of capitalism. That is, we describe the value of justice in terms of productivity. It sounds like a value-add sales pitch, which of course negates the plea for justice to a subsidiary of capitalism. It makes justice something you want, maybe another desire, but to get it, you have to kneel before its abuser. <sighs> Now, in this way, any negativity towards capitalism is negated. It negates itself in its attempt to be taken seriously, to be heard or implemented in our really socially normalized capitalist society that we're in right now. This is how humans are rewritten. The one-dimensional man is the product of a one-dimensional cybernetic management structure. It is the co-optation of all values under one perspective. Part 3. Deterritorialization. 
Somewhere in the 70s and 80s, Deleuze and Watari, they started turning out these really bizarre and exciting philosophical books, such as Anti-Oedipus and 1000 Plateaus, which, I don't know, in the mid-90s, this was like required reading for any artist, but of course, I didn't read them. I didn't need it. <laughs> But in school, of course, I couldn't avoid terms like rhizome and deterritorialization. Now, in layman's terms, the rhizome is a grass-like, kind of flat-spreading, rather than an arboreal or tree-like central hierarchy, which has really profound implications for how we consider the world. Coming from feudalism and hierarchy, yeah, many of our structures still are top-down. They're not decentralized. But when you can really grasp the unique qualities of a lack of center or a lack of hierarchy, it's kind of staggering. Now, deterritorialization is, I know, shocking, the opposite of territorialization. But of course, being philosophy, it's never quite that simple. Now, much of DNG's philosophy was influenced by cybernetic theory. So we're gonna map some of these terms over. Deleuze and Watari were thinking in terms of processes and flows rather than static events cause effect, the old scientific pin it to the bug board and name it technique. Now, in cybernetic theory, the forces that modulated the dynamic system were called positive and negative energies. Now, principally, you needed regulation valves, and these would be the negatives, to balance out positive energies. Positive energy tended to spiral out of control as exuberance, and it could explode the entire system. So you had to moderate it. So from the previous example, the steam in a steam engine, this is positive or it might be a riot in the street. This is also a form of positive energy, even if it's fed by rage, which is considered a negative emotion. So I'm not trying to make this complicated, just trying to point it out here. So for instance, our cry for justice is really Marcuse's term organic negativity. And this is because it's against the system. It's an alternative to the one dimension. But in cybernetic terms, this is a positive energy that must be managed, regulated, or diverted, lest it explode the capitalist one-dimensional system. So DNG considered deterritorialization as the negative, the confining or restraining force, the governor, if you will, that limited unchecked expansion. Now, what all this meant is that to break or decode the system, you would deterritorialize this management of checks and balances. Now what this would do is you could spin up the energies released until it's no longer identified or constrained by the limitations or territory that was previously imposed upon it. And naturally, I mean, you could see how imperialism and colonialism were territorialization. And these were through capitalist goals to contain while pilfering and exploiting the positive energies of an area or culture. This was control, manage, extract. Now the same could be said of women, right? They are territorialized, and to deterritorialize is to break the frame attempting to contain or define them. So, one more time. I know this might seem redundant, but I'm just going to keep hammering on it. To deterritorialize is to transcend or break free of the shackles and restrictions of the hegemonic authority, the regulating valve, the governor limiting you and your values, the system that normalizes your repression. So, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and break capitalist desire, right? Why don't we just break management bureaucracy? Just spin up all the positive energies, baby. Yeah, I mean, even if it means ugly vibes, let's just rage against the machine and break it. Part four, re-territorialization. As you know, all that rage, that positive energy that would break the system, yeah, this has all been attempted before. And yet, capitalism and management hierarchies still survive. Now, the glorious predicted future of the Marxist revolution, it has never arrived, comrades. And yet, given the weight of capitalism's contradictions, its surplus growth, and the alienation and estrangement of people, yeah, it just seemed like it would break itself or be overthrown from a purely moral standpoint. Well, yeah we might consider that our rage is automatically establishing a binary of opposites within the system. This actually shifts things into good, evil, black, white, us, them. And then this becomes part of the game, the framework, if you will, which captures our attention and somehow actually prevents us from moving beyond or through the duality itself. 
we actually get stuck at the level of the binary where, yes, of course, we have all these positive energies spun up, all these extremes, but they are somehow contained and managed and limited, maybe diverted, and they're used by the system. They're actually looping around and round and never breaking free. Now, something to consider is how concepts play out in negating or castrating these positive energies, especially under this system. For instance, repressive tolerance is, of course, a catch-22. We think tolerance is great, but to demand tolerance is to be repressive of others, which is then intolerant, right? So this contradictory double bind where our own energies are inverted against us, yeah, where does that come from, right? But this all seems to be happening under the same one-dimensional lens. Now, adjustments within the cybernetic system of capitalism and management allow for some change, right? We will see change happen. But the system is dynamically and slyly balancing your new freedoms against new exploitations. So maybe half the world away, somebody else is paying for the cost of your newly granted freedom. And really, the simplistic danger of this is that every victory invokes a not-in-my-backyard kind of cost elsewhere. You're morally bound not to act. And this is the ultimate neutering. Beyond the deterritorialization of Deleuze and Guattari, Mark Fisher says, we have a system that immediately re-territorializes the deterritorialization. That is, it takes those positive energy we spin up to break the management system or ideological framework, and somehow capitalism and management uses them to regulate itself to reabsorb them. That is, when the pressure is too high and the system allows deterritorialization, what it does is it learns how to recalibrate and become more anonymous, but also insidiously, it immediately offers a capitalist solution to your new autonomy. In a disheartening fashion, our attacks, our rebellious spirit, better show the chinks, the weak spots that capitalism has and is in need of shoring up. As we discussed previously in the forms of Elvis and Che Guevara, the rebellion becomes a slogan that becomes a fashion statement, a flattened aesthetics of rebellion. This is politics as pictures, and this has become a management tactic which, as a little aside here, Walter Benjamin said that fascism is an aesthetics of politics, which is really weird to think about. Once again, a flattened simulacrum where the appearance is more real, more vibrantly vital than the original motivating values or cause. Yeah, so this can all be a little bit depressing. And before we really move into the light, let's consider some more unhelpful theories. Hooray! <laughs> okay, so Thomas Hobbes says way back in 1651 in Leviathan that he can't see a path from the current system to the future world envisaged, the one that really solves the state control mechanism without some sort of major complete reset. This is like a crash and reboot. Now, Karl Marx predicts a future that can, of course, only come after the revolution. Essentially, we have to break the value system to enter a paradigm where the values of comradely care and morality can survive. And what happens is there's a gap here. There's a void between where we are and the place, the utopia that we can imagine being, even if it's theoretically structured, right? And, and as we discussed last episode, that gap itself is vital to our understanding. The utopia is always placed on an unreachable far shore in the distant future, and it requires an insane leap but this is a leap over an impossible gap. So what happens is it's not really the right or left antagonism we should be focusing on here, because essentially the fact that they're playing so hard means they've already been captured or duped by their own contrary versions of utopia that are fueled by either more individual or collective capitalism. Our goal here today is by exposing the apparatus of how this works, we can not only make transparent the follies that people are undertaking and the system is forcing upon us, but maybe we can find a clear path through that's really not described by the left and the right's sort of divisive excesses. Now, another kind of unhelpful suggestion, but one we should look at is Pacone from Step 64. 
his artificial negativity. He said that we need Marcuse's organic negativity, and that is, of course, a set of principles beyond the reach of capitalist logic, which has the possibility to break or reorder the system. Another reset, right? Now, I'm going to repeat this, but Pacone says that everything inside capitalism is staged. It is artificial negativity. So in cybernetic terms, the seeming negative behavior is all really a regulation valve by which the system adjusts. It's a huge steam whistle. And by using the paths of the system, by lobbying, by voting, by online reviews, we're simply providing feedback. We're not deterritorializing. So that's kind of the problem I was talking about earlier. And of course, the follow-up question to Bacone comes back to this idea of the utopia again. Where can this very particular organic evolution be nurtured? Where are we going to get this organic negativity that's going to break the system? I mean, and what this is, is how are we going to slowly evolve an alternative set of ideas beyond the reach of capitalism? Of course, Bacone thought it had to happen under state control, some sort of void or bubble that would be carved out by the state in which it could grow, which to me just sounds ludicrous. Now, interestingly, Mark Fisher, aka K-Punk, he discusses the movements of the youth carving out a bubble through participation in raves, in the spirit of avant-garde music, to form a collective solidarity outside the controls, or, or maybe not outside, but under the radar of the major left-right antagonisms. It just wasn't participating. It is creativity happening under the systemic co-optation of everything, because not everything can be co-opted or captured. And as Bataille says, society, yes, it produces a surplus, and capitalism's nature is to expand production, which is to increase that surplus. Now, the system itself actually encourages overproduction, right? But perhaps, since capitalism harnesses desire and stimulates it, perhaps we ourselves produce an uncapturable excess of libido, a surplus of desire that cannot be socially regulated. Maybe it can't be regulated at all. And we might even consider that coupled with the excessive repression generated by capitalism, and what that is, is that's how society attempts to channel our desires by repressing some to better release those that actually favor capitalism. Well, wouldn't that dynamic of excess repressed under pressure invoke a disproportionate resentment? Now, this is interesting to consider. Rather than rage against the machine and burn it all down, this would drive a solidarity of refusal, paradoxically birthed by the desire and rage the system programmed into us. It appears maybe as malaise or apathy from the outside. It looks like an aesthetics of non-participation. Yet non-compliance is hard for the system to co-opt. When you don't scream out to the state to solve your problems, how does a cybernetic state regulate itself? Non-action is zero feedback, a broken sensor, a smashed camera. It is a void or a gap in the all-encompassing totalization. The narrative of passivity laying fallow, yeah, it's not exactly a superhero story, but it is a rebellion and it's a space to deprogram the big other's manipulations, or should I say machinations. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. So the big question here is given all these difficulties, our total capture by the system, as some thinkers claim, is there another option? If we are stuck inside the beast, inside the brainwashing machine, is there another way out? Well, yes, maybe, but it also has its problems. So tune into our next episode where I'm gonna discuss maybe not this sort of passivity of lying fallow, or non-participation, but maybe hyper-participation in accelerationism, where the only way out is through. And of course, if you enjoyed the show today, or you picked up anything useful from it, please consider writing a review for the podcast, or giving us a lot of stars, or a thumbs up, or something like that. And if you really, really enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend or two. And if you really, really, really enjoyed the show, you can support us at letusthinkaboutit.com, with a monetary one-time donation or even monthly support on the website, right? Thank you very much. That's at letusthinkaboutit.com. So until next time, stay safe. <laughs>